Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah you sound real good. You come in real good. Okay. Yeah. And we are live. So it says. All right. So as soon as we have somebody join us here in just a moment, we'll begin the show. We are live and on the air for those who might be catching the uh, beginning here. A lot of great things going on, a lot of exciting things going on. And uh, so, well, hey, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Healed Because God Said So, where, you know, I think healing is much more attainable uh, as far as walking in the wholeness of the father if we change the way we think or when and as we change the way we think so praise the lord good to see dr k fairchild joining us this evening she is my guest this thursday night on kingdom dynamics and um it took me a while to catch on but we we actually we actually have a great topic for you this thursday uh good to see apostle jermaine jumping in here professor jermaine um and uh, there's Dr. Michael Porter. Appreciate you, brothers, so very much. And we'll give this just a moment here while folks are chiming in. Uh, yeah, so a lot of folks are starting to join us tonight. So it's really great to see everybody. And um, it's really great to uh, be uh, not only acquainted with, but in the family of... Uh, uh, who is uh, the, the headed by, uh, you talk about the head of the family. Uh, this, this isn't the Italian mafia. This is, this is Father God. He is the head of the family. Right. And we're, uh, we're his offspring. And some good things we're going to be talking about tonight as we get into uh, talking about this, um, this stuff. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, so anyway, you know what? Uh, good to see everybody. Um, yeah, so anyway, praise the Lord. Well, thank God for all of you. And um, let me take care of this one thing here. All right. So we've been talking about righteousness unveiled. And the truth is um, – we're in part three, and part three is exciting because there's just so much more uh, to really uh, grab hold of here as we move into this today. But you know what? Um, we're really glad to see everyone. Good to see Myla Ferris joining us this evening and uh, others as we move along. Already a whole lot of folks are watching. So as we started last time, uh, the last two weeks, actually talking about 2 Corinthians 5.21, and really, uh, thanks to Dr. Michael Porter and others, really got into this um, uh, uh, the whole chapter there. We're going to switch gears tonight and uh, look at something that I had on my mind last time, uh, which was what Paul was saying in Romans 1.17. And although Paul uh, it was, it was assumed that he was dealing with some stuff. He just simply says for, he talks about, I'm ready to go preach the gospel at Rome. And he says, uh, in verse 17, for in it, talking about the gospel, which we know is the good news, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we're going to tear apart tonight what really is righteousness. We're going to look at the dictionary meaning. We're going to look at the Bible meaning. And, and when I say Bible meaning, uh, it's the best searches that you can come up with. And then you got to put your own kind of your own definition or own take on the, the thing. Uh, but as we look at this tonight, uh, when I think about what Paul said here, and I had a different direction I was going to go, but, but when he says that the, the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, we know that faith to faith really can be for us are the things we're persuaded of as we move from one persuasion to another persuasion, or I could say from an awakening to an awakening, our awareness actually expands and increases. And, and so you know, while we all know on this panel tonight and many of you watching tonight, probably all of you know that uh, when we look at the Bible in and of itself, that what is contained in the 66 books that were finally uh, canonized into Scripture and adjusted through the years was not all that God had to say, but it certainly 
um, uh, you know, depending on who's uh, looking at it in my classes, I teach that, you know, some of it probably shouldn't even been in there. And you take some of the things Job said, poor old Job said, uh, you know, uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, that was definitely not the inspired word of God, but it was uh, Job's own situation that like uh, we've been in before where we've just, you know, blurted out some stuff that really wasn't God, but um, it sounded real, you know, real humble and, and uh, all of that. But, but when Paul says here that, that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, I really like that because there is a lot of things, once we take the English version of the gospel that we have, and then we, we interpret that or properly translate that, we really do find that in the Father's mind, there is a revelation, and it just moves us from one place to another place. And so I wanted to start with this because Paul's, when we get to the Passion Translation a little bit, there was some things about the Torah that really uh, confirmed some of this in the way they saw things things, uh, which really wasn't the whole gospel or really wasn't the gospel at all. But as we look at the, the and, and I hear again, again, I almost said new covenant, as we look at the eternal covenant of the father, we do see some things where we move from one place to another in revelation. So uh, let me throw this out tonight. Apostle Jermaine, uh, kick us off tonight. What do you see here, my brother? Um, you know, does the gospel, the, the true, the real gospel, uh, is it really the righteousness of God that moves us from faith to faith or from a place of believing to another? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to, to uh, terms association, and we was talking a little bit about this before uh, we got on, um, uh, our word association oftentimes or uh, understand that the ophthalmology of words is equally important, but uh, when, when oftentimes when we hear the word righteousness, or I'll say when I have heard it, uh, it's often associated, you know, with a, a mindset uh, rooted in uh, schools of thought of like penal substitution, you know, uh, an angry God, you know, a uh, wrathful God, you know, so executing, you know, his righteousness. And so we say things like God is a righteous judge, you know, uh, and we, we, we present that in, 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 in a uh, context, you know, that, that is representative of, of behavioral, moral aptitude, you know, rather than the context of his unveiled nature or in the yeah. context of nature. And so uh, it's, 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 uh, it's something when you read uh, the accounts and the stories about Moses and his encounter uh, when God hit him in the cliff of the rock. The first thing that God uh, allowed to pass past uh, Moses was his goodness, you know, before he unveiled his name. And so, you know, like you were saying about this awareness, we go from one awareness to the next. And so first God allowed his goodness to pass uh, through uh, Moses. So allegorically or metaphorically, you can look at that, you know, in his awareness from revelation to revelation. And then he, re he revealed the substance of his name. And so uh, in all of that, was for Moses to con for Moses for that to be mirrored in Moses because Moses is like well I'm going to go and tell the elders who sent me and he said I am and so uh, it was all about the unveiling of his of of him seeing God's nature and as he was seeing the unveiling of God's nature the true essence of who he has always been was being revealed as well um, as far as his nature and so he was able in spite his more after two, you know, Moses killed folks and, you know, he, you know, uh, so more after two uh, 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 is, 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 you see it in a different framework, more a, as, as a fruit uh, or the result of righteousness than, than to do moral, to, to be accepted in righteousness as if it's associated with some type of behavioral modification. This is more so about the reality of nature. And so the gospel, as you were saying, uh, reveals the, the good news of God's nature and not just his nature, but his nature that's ha that has always been mirrored in us. You know, we've wrestled with uh, the, a dualistic uh, frame mind or, or, or mind frame, I call it a mind frame of, of association. And so righteousness, uh, we associate it in, in, in a context of leg legalities more than the context of nature. Yeah, 
absolutely. And and we've we've uh, we've ignorantly uh, over the years operated in a dualistic mindset. Didn't mean to, but we did. Um, and so now that we understand it, we're getting out of that uh, because dualism uh, is like a positive and a negative. It, uh, it, if I'm correct, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. That it, it always ends up zero, and it doesn't produce anything. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Dr. Michael, um, do we good to see Dr. Cindy joining us tonight? Uh, they're from Hawaii, where the palm trees are blowing in the ocean, and yeah, <laughs> and so the rest of us are at home. I, I'm floating around in space. It looks like, but uh, prophesy, <laughs> prophesy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Michael, uh, just just take us on from from here. I mean. Uh, the good news. I mean, there, there's nothing bad about the gospel. There's nothing about about the message that of Father's heart, and um, it really does bring revelation. Uh, so, talk to take us on from here, would you? Sure. Um, looking at that verse you had, Romans uh, one seventeen, mm -hmm. about the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Um, well, I think that for me when I changed the understanding of righteousness, um, it changed a lot of things for me. I mean, the first word that jumps out to me there is revealed. Mm. In other words, this is in awareness. This is not something that has a transaction that has to happen. In other words, you weren't unrighteous before, and now you're righteous as in something substantive. You were unrighteous in your thinking, which made you believe you were unrighteous, so you acted unrighteous. And now it's been revealed to you that you are righteous. And mm -hmm. as you understand that you are righteous, you begin to act righteously. And so my definition of righteousness for me, not for the panel, but for me is more like a state of harmony in consciousness. It's when I come to realize, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, I have not mastered this yet. <laughs> I still have my moments. I still have my moments. But it's when I become to realize that you know, I am one with the Father, one in spirit, one in understanding. This brings my being into a state of harmony that it's always had, but just not realized. So it brings me into this or brings forth this beauty, this, this perfection, this wonderful love, love experience that we really are. That's the essence of our being. So to yeah. me, all of this is happening in awareness. The word revealed is the key. And then that word faith, I almost looked at faith like something I had to do or had to have before. And, you know, it was either little or big. Usually if something I believed in happened, well, my faith must have been pretty good. And if it didn't happen, my faith must have been, you know, lacking in some kind of way. But I would uh, relate faith. And um, now I would say that faith is the perceiving power of our minds Link to be able to draw what is unseen into the seen realm. That's what faith is. And uh, we, if you said, I think you said Dr. K was on a few minutes ago. Um, she is excellent in talking about the pineal gland. And I would say that faith, that is the place where faith activates that um, spiritual eye, pineal gland. And it's where we have a knowing in our consciousness and this works, it says faith, the scripture says faith works by love. So as my conscious awareness awakens to love and I begin to look into the unseen realm, I can perceive those things in the spirit and then they manifest or become visible in the natural. And this is not work. It works by love. It doesn't work by work. It works by love. And so I believe that the pineal gland is the center of faith activation. And as we concentrate in thought on this center, we bring things forth by focusing on it. It's just a simple, I think in quantum mechanics, they call it focused attention. And as we focus on these things, so now I got a new definition for faith. I got a new definition for righteousness. Yeah. Things are getting easier for me. Because right. now I'm not trying to be righteous. Righteous is a state of being or a state of right. awareness. And so faith is not something I got to exercise and work hard and build up. It's something I already possess. I just need to understand in my awareness how it works. So this, this faith 
is activated by me merely beginning to believe or being revealed to me or understood by me what is already true of me, always has been true of me. And as I begin to live that out and walk that out, I go from faith to faith to faith to faith. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, we have a, uh, a course that will be coming up in WVSU. Uh, I believe it's titled His Faith Versus My Faith. And, you know, Paul said he lives by the faith of the Son of God, which if, if, the, the, if, if in the eternal Christ, the, the many-membered body of the one, uh, there's enough of the Father's faith to go around, then I've had to consider what is my faith. And my faith is really being persuaded of the truth that's in the Father's mind. And, and so, uh, but, but when you said, um, when you said uh, something like uh, that, you know, to, to, when we look at righteousness, righteousness being unveiled or revealed, uh, you know, and, and, and when we understand that, then we walk uh, righteously or, or rightly, uh, something to that effect. Uh, I thought about Dr. K is going to be on this Thursday, and we're going to be talking about immortality. Uh, but but when she sent me, uh, when we were communicating, I kept reading it wrong, and I kept saying immorality. How, how are we going to talk about immorality? I said, Dr. Kev never, <laughs> never talked about immorality, and it was immortality the whole time. A little bit different subject than we got going on here when we talk about the flip side of, of, of people's view of righteousness. Before I bring Dr. Cindy on, uh, the, yeah, I told a joke in the, in the, uh, the, the chat room. Uh, you you uh, weren't there, Dr. Michael, and I should have sent it to you, but you know, it's like the preacher that was preaching, uh, and I actually heard this. This, this is true. A preacher that we knew in the past that would uh, sir, uh, title his sermons very uh, in very crazy ways he was preaching about Sodom and Gomorrah and he, his title of his message was there's going to be a hot time in the old town tonight <laughs> well, I told everybody that was kind of like what I thought about the show tonight it was going to be exciting uh, so anyway the English dictionary defines righteousness as the quality of being morally right or justifiable but you know, the thing I find is, is that when people are not morally right, it does not make them less righteous right. than the Father's eye in the view, because he didn't create us as anything less than. And uh, uh, so, you know, I remember years ago in my veiled perception, I was, I was just asking Holy Spirit, you know, what is righteousness really? And what I heard were the words that righteousness is the right to stand in the presence of God. Now, I, I understand now that his presence is who he is, that I, I am in his presence. We are present just like we are on camera tonight. But the fact is, is that I, I realize that I have right standing no matter what. That's the right. only one that can tell me I don't have right standing is the thoughts in my own mind. Uh, right. Like the scripture says in Colossians, they were, they were alienated from God in their own mind, in their own thoughts. So let me read this from the Passion Translation, then we'll let Dr. Cindy uh, put it in her uh, take on this. Uh, the Passion Translation says, the gospel unveils a continual revelation of God's righteousness. Uh, this word righteousness um, uh, is a really big Greek word, and it means equity of character or actions. Uh, a perfect righteousness given to us when we believe, it moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith or by persuasion. This is what the scripture means when it says we are right with God through life-giving faith. And so this is why I say again, if I have to have life-giving faith to make me right with God, something's wrong with that picture. But when I look at the Father's right-giving faith, his life-giving faith that I've been infused with, that made me right. That positions me as right. So the question always comes up, whose, whose faith is it that made us right? Was it, was it my faith? Was it his faith? Uh, and Paul said he lived by that faith. So Dr. Cindy, uh, take us on from here and... Um, We'll, we'll see where we land. Okay. Well, hey, guys. It's great to be with you guys and everybody tonight. Um, and blame Dr. Bill for my um, virtual um, beach because he's the one that showed me how to do that <laughs> with a green screen. I'm, I'm not trying to be deceptive. I'm just trying to be prophetic. I'm believing God for the beach, okay? Um, so, anyway. <laughs> um, Anyway, let's see. 
Equity. Did you just say that? I, I love did. that. I love that word. Equity. So equity means is it actually comes from French. That's what my mother's family. They're French. So I when I hear some words, sometimes I just hear the French, uh, the French saying it the way they do, which means equal. Equal. Equity means equal. Okay, that's heavy. You know, a lot of people can't handle that. They can't handle that. And that's because of the indoctrination of religion that taught us to have that dualistic mindset. You know, that, that we're not one with God, that we're way down here on the earth and we have to like yell up in the sky, hey God, can you hear me? You know, kind of deal. And um, it's sad that we've been taught that because I was, I was thinking when Apostle Germain was talking about why would we even question the being the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? I mean, why would that even be something we would um, buck or we would not want? I mean, it's just such a good deal, right? I mean, it's such a good deal. And what deal. it is, is we've been taught, we've actually been taught that to think that we are righteous is um, prideful. Like what? You're walking in pride, aren't you? How dare you? You need to be humble and beaten down, you know, and, and see yourself like the some hymn we used to all sing in the church for such a worm as I. Yeah. Remember that part? We used yep. to all laugh. All the kids would start laughing, you know, during that particular verse because it was funny, you know, because you know how you see what you said, you know, you can have imagination. We all saw ourselves as worms, you know, in a, in a, you know, little bucket by somebody fishing and then they're going to you know, stick a hook in us and throw us in the lake. I mean, it was ridiculous. All these things that we have been taught and the things that we've been, um, you know, trained to believe about ourselves. When it, it's absolutely completely contrary to what God says. It is. And, and the, you know, the most humble thing, let's talk about that pride versus humility, because I'm all for humility. I believe humility, there's, it's a powerful place. God said he would exalt the humble. He'd give grace to the humble. To be humble is a, is a thing to be, but the most humble thing we can be or the most humble thing we can do is to agree with what God says. You know, when I had, when I was diagnosed with leukemia, I, I had to agree that God said I was healed. Sure. And people thought I was being real arrogant running around saying I was healed of leukemia. What are you talking about? You weigh 96 pounds and you're five, nine and you look like a skeleton you know, and your hair looks like a punk rock because it was falling out. And I mean, it looked like a rooster or a chicken. You know, if you can imagine this skinny, tall, chicken hair looking woman running around saying she's healed. You know, and I had all the signs of having leukemia. But, but guys, um, I chose to align myself with what God said. I believe that's what God said. I believe that was because that brought me into equity, equality with Jesus. Jesus didn't have leukemia. Jesus doesn't have cancer. Like they told me I had cancer. Well, when they said I had cancer, well, I knew Jesus didn't have cancer. So I have equity with him. We've been made, <laughs> it's hard for a religious mind to wrap around this, but we have been made to be like him when when the father sees us he sees jesus is what he sees he sees yeah. his he sees us we're in him we're in christ and christ is in us so there is there is equity there's equality there's equality with christ we're not um and, and who did that jesus did it jesus made us the very righteousness of God in Christ, in himself, and in Christ Jesus, in himself. So um, the, the hindrance of, uh, the hindrance of wrapping our mind around this would be having really um, false humility, right? Which is pride. Mm -hmm. And real pride is to say to God, 
oh no, I'm not going to get in agreement with what you said. I'm going to agree with all these religious people are saying down here on TV and radio and the internet. I'm going to, I'm not going to agree with you, God. I'm going to agree with them. That's real pride. That's real false humility. Yeah. And, and that's why we have to um, have new definitions of words like Dr. Uh, Michael Porter was just saying, we need do, new definitions mm -hmm. of words because when we get our, our glossary upgraded <laughs> to present truth 2.0 <laughs> we, we um our, our mind gets renewed and we're transformed by that and and i'm excited to hear the word equity it's just like uh when we praise the lord you know we're taught praise the lord what does that mean it means to appraise the lord give him an appraisal like if you had your house appraised what is that going to do? It's going to show you if you've got equity. Do you have value? Okay. It's a appraisal and equity. Th these things all are same. the same thing. It's talking about value and it's, it's talking about worth. And, and you know, what, how I always know if I'm around religious indoctrination is if they start talking about being less than what God says you are. That is like red flags. Now, l let me just say this, uh, that, you know, when we talk about being righteous, I, I know that I know that in my word of faith days, we would go around saying, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And there was songs about that. And we, and it's, it's a great profession of faith. Uh, but, there's more to the story than just that. And, and, and what we want to, I love what you said, Dr. Cindy, that, you know, when we say that we're less than what God says we are as a, as thinking that it's humility, uh, it's really, really to, to reject, to, uh, to reject truth is not really humility at all. It's really foolishness. Uh, but I, I'll just say this, that uh, who I am uh, is who I've been created to be from the beginning of time. And I will say it this way, that I am no more than that. And I'm certainly no less than that. I'm exactly everything that God says that I am. And like I said, uh, last time, I think it was on this show that, that to go through the Bible uh, that we have and just look for everything that God says that we are, and then to embrace that and believe that, that would be a life-changing experience in and of itself. You know, uh, Apostle Jermaine, before I turn the mic to you, when we talk about that, that this righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, to the Jews, it meant moving from uh, faith in what the Torah said and doing well or, or good deeds in a, in a faith-based um, or, or a works-based, uh, uh, um, you know, type thing versus um, when we look to Yahshua, when we look to Jesus, the living Torah. And again, when I say Jesus, when I say Yahshua, when I say uh, Christ, I'm talking about the eternal Christ, the, 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 uh, the, the one who is that we are as he is, so is he of the many-membered body. Uh, and, and, and they believed that he alone was the only one that could bring us into salvation's power. But the fact is this, that, that a, a, a better way to translate salvation is to be rescued, uh, rescued in our faulty mindsets and our mistaken identity, be rescued to a true mindset. And, and that's, that's the thing that I love about uh, the revelation of righteousness. Uh, I wrote this down and I, I don't know if I shared this online, but I certainly have it in my notes that the word revelation of righteousness is a genitive of, of source or cause. And what that means to me is that righteousness did not come in an, an, an earthly beginning, uh, it, but it was the beginning of your origin. So people today that are watching, if you think that you became righteous all of a sudden because you prayed a sinner's prayer, that honestly, folks, isn't even in your Bible, okay? Uh, that that's all those sinner prayers, whatever they are, are made up and generally filled with condemnation. I'm just being honest with you because I've prayed them all. I've, I've wrote some of them. I mean, I know, you know, I've interacted with all of that in the past. So I'm just telling you that the fact is, is that who you are, this is, this is true salvation to wake up to who 
Father God said that you always have been. And that yeah. rescues you from a life of turmoil and religious, um, uh, let's just be honest, religious nonsense. Um, Apostle Germain, uh, that what probably wasn't a very good setup, but uh, uh, go for it, brother. <laughs> no, it's uh, this, the, these things speak to, you know, uh, what the various things we cover, you know, on this uh, platform you know, is uh, we're talking about conditioning, uh, <clears throat> religious conditioning, and we're talking about the need to be reconditioned um, so that we can wake up to the reality of who Father says that we are. Um, and, and we're talking about a show, right, <laughs> about being healed. I said this before. Uh, and we're talking about everything other than what we traditionally what we've been uh, talk about uh, how to approach healing. We're talking about changing the way you think. And so your, your, your very health, the very essence of your, your health, wealth, and well-being um, is in the revelation of you uh, embracing who Father says that you are and who you have always been. And so uh, it's, it's almost as if, if you look at the picture of Abraham, for example, it's like God had to trick him into his righteousness <laughs> so, <laughs> in a, because he put the man to sleep. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, and he woke up, you know, we, we say, you know, he was, it was accounted unto Abraham because of his faith. Righteousness is appeared upon Abraham because of his faith. Um, yet, you know, he had no moral aptitude, no moral code or, 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 or sense to, um, uh, to lead him into a right standing with God. This was all about God's nature and sharing uh, the reality and the revelation of, of the essence of our nature. Uh, it, it was never about a behavioral modification or behavioral plan, um, you know, as if God good, man bad. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, uh, our caveman approach, God good, man bad, you know, type of approach. And understand it. Excuse my dog uh, in the background. Uh, That's all right. Uh, your dog saying amen. He, he wants to come it, in. He wants your, to get the conversation. Ringtone. Just your ringtone. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's in. He wants to come hang out. I think he wants to come say hi. Uh, come on, come on, and I'll get back to my point. Woo. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so he wants to come say hi. But anyway, um, but just just in gist and saying that Abraham, you know, God tricked him to his righteousness. But it, it gives us a picture of showing us that was never about, you know, behavior. This is about a, uh, embracing the reality, you know, of your or, of your nature or the scripture would say a new nature or is new in the sense of us coming to experience it. Like uh, Dr. Porter said, you know, he hasn't mastered it i haven't mastered it uh but we're well on our way of experiencing uh the good news not just in the context of scripture and you know hearing these testimonies or seeing god use these different people that's their story that's their encounter with his righteousness being unveiled in them what is my story of his righteousness being unveiled in me what does that look like in my life what does that shape uh it shapes a different sense of awareness and a sense of being, uh, a sense of authenticity. Uh, it, it paints a reality that goodness is all about me and encompassing within me. It's not something that's outside of me. Uh, and so there's a deeper sense of, 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 of self um, and what, what we wrestled with in our understanding and our mindset you know, is a bruised ego. It is the bruised human ego that strives to see myself less than, unequal to, you know, and have that sense of striving. I have to strive for righteousness, you know. Um, I have to press in, you know, for that righteousness because I don't feel righteous. And it has nothing about feeling anything. This yeah, is about yeah. the reality of your nature. You don't have to feel your heart in order for it to function it's innate it's it's nature it's natural it's biological this is how you are meant to operate and so righteousness 
is our default, our origin, our original uh, design is to live, move, breathe, and have our being in righteousness. Um, yeah. And so yeah. this is about, as, as Dr. Porter pointed out, it's about our being in a sense of, uh, of, of wellness, life, prosperity is not something out there. I lack no good thing, everything I need. He's given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And so living out of, seeing myself in the light of who Father says that I am, you know, acknowledging my life in that regard. Paul said it like this in uh, Colossians 3 and 1. He says, see yourselves co-raised with Christ. Now mm -hmm. ponder with persuasion the consequences of your, your, your co-inclusion in him. Relocate yourselves mentally. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities where you are co-seated with Christ and the executive authority of God's right hand. And I think somebody in the comment section was saying something about the, the context of the Godhead. Uh, in as much as you are in Christ and Christ is in you, or you are included in the Godhead. So it's, it's, it's the reality, you know, of, of, of present truth, you know, that we're conveying and stating and hopefully uh, sharing uh, what's, what's the good news that is refreshing, reviving, you know, to the human heart because it speaks, it resonates with us at, at a deep level. This thing goes beyond just natural int intelligence. It goes beyond natural reasoning. Uh, and it speaks to the core of our being because this is our true nature. This is why you, 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 uh, you're being persuaded. This is why you can't run from yourself because there's no place where God is not. <laughs> so to encounter God is to encounter the reality and the substance of who you really are. That's good news. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and I think I think really what we're saying tonight is what God says you are, that's what you need to embrace. You know, we really do have a, a, a wonderful creator, a wonderful father, and he loves us better than any earthly daddy could. And some of some folks have had some really great relationships with their their father and their mother. Uh, but I'm telling you, Father God, uh, that's how I I learn about relationship is is how he treats me. Um, Dr. Michael, th this is such an important thing to know that from the beginning of time that we are exactly who God says we are, even though we didn't realize that in this earthly awareness state, we are getting our thinking together. Amen. Yes, I agree. And thank you for what everybody has said. I want to uh, read Roman, one of your scriptures you provided for us was, excuse me, Hebrews 1.8. It said, I thought there was a lot of important things in Hebrews 1 8. It says, Your your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And I won't stop. I'll just use eight right there. But I like the way verse eight begins. It says, But to the son he says. Now, a lot of times, or in times past, I would take that, okay, he's talking to Jesus now, who is the Son of God. But I, I want to maybe get this frame of reference. He's talking to the son that you are. Because in Revelation, Jesus makes this statement. Dr. Bill's on here. He's the Revelation expert and Dr. K. Jesus says in Revelation, if you come in talking about the most holy place where the table of showbread is, he says, if you come in and have this meal with me, in other words, you eat these two stacks of bread, which, you know, the teaching, he died, I died. He was crucified. I was crucified. He said, I will let you sit on my father's throne with me. In other words, we're all located in the same throne. So it says the, to the son, yeah. he says to the son that you are, he's saying this, your throne. Now we're talking about your throne, not God's throne, your throne. He's saying to the son that you are, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. And so let me maybe relate it like this for myself. God is my throne and I am his. Mm -hmm. We're both seated in the same seat yeah. when we come to this revelation that Jesus is talking about and have this meal together and this supper together. And we finally awaken to the truth of who we are. And so he says, your throne is forever and forever. And you have a scepter of righteousness 
uh, it's the set righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom in other words so the scepter of the kingdom is righteousness which is right understanding or being in harmonious relationship That's and to good. me the kingdom of god is not a place far away or a place at all the kingdom of god is christ consciousness so Amen. the scepter of christ consciousness is the knowledge of righteousness Amen. it's the scepter of your kingdom so as you sit on in the throne of God, with God, in that place, you have a scepter in your hand. And now if you just look up scepter, a scepter is a symbol of power. So mm -hmm. what is your power? Your power is righteousness. And what is that, that righteousness? That righteousness is when you come to the correct understanding of who you are in him and then you operate in the kingdom. And so now all this stuff Jesus is saying about, listen, this kingdom is going to come without observation, he said. And why is it going to come without observation? It's going to come with revelation yes. within you, this kingdom. You're mm -hmm. going to come mm -hmm. to realize you are the king sitting on the throne and the scepter of the kingdom, which is righteousness, is in your hand when you come to Christ conscious awareness. And you're going to realize that you have the symbol of power, yeah. but it's not dominating power. It's <laughs> the power of love because yeah. righteousness operates in love. And so this righteousness, this harmonious state of mind is the person who elevates in their consciousness to awareness of oneness, to awareness. They've had this meal now. He died. I think Apostle Germain mentioned it. Death, burial, resurrection. If you keep eating this meal, this lamb, this long enough, you'll come to the realization, this word long enough. If you keep having this, you'll come to the realization of the right, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you will be seated in your conscious awareness on the throne with God. God is your throne and you are his. And to me, this is the key to the kingdom. Jesus said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. They weren't literal keys to a literal place. They were keys to come to the understanding of Christ consciousness. That's what they were. He said, I'm going to give you the keys to help you understand that you are Christ consciousness, mm -hmm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the hope of glory is. So as I change my definitions and I change my understanding, now everything is internal. Nothing is external. The kingdom is not dependent upon what is happening outside of me, right. but what is happening inside of me. And as I become aware of seating, sitting on that throne and having that meal with Jesus and coming to this understanding, I go right past the altar of incense, go right into the most holy place, and yeah. I am seated right there in the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. This has already happened. Jesus has brought this to our attention and I would say that it is, it is true uh, um, uh, subjectively of every man, yes, but right. it's only true objectively of the men who wake up to it. And by men, I mean people. So this, yeah. this scepter and this kingdom is something you possess. Re being in a religious mindset, Dr. Bill and guys, ladies, I thought all the time that this was a God who was external of me a kingdom that was external of me, a throne that was external of me, a scepter that was external of me. I never saw myself in that position, Father giving us, putting us in that position. But once I do, I realize this, Dr. Bill, this will be the last thing I'll say here. I'm the king of my kingdom. Yeah. The scepter of righteousness is in my hand. Whatever mm -hmm. I approve is approved. If I lower the scepter, it's accepted. And so I, now I'm not, I'm not dependent on some external force outside of me to, to do something for me. I now know that all of that is inside of me. That is the core of my being. That is who I am. And now when I speak, I'm speaking as the king of my kingdom. The scepter is in my hand. So if my kingdom is not functioning the way it should be, guess what? The king needs to change his speech. Amen. He needs to change his speech and he needs to start mm -hmm. talking differently and he needs to start making a different decree in the kingdom. Yes, yes, Man. yes. And, and you've just opened up so many, um, you know, <laughs> so much stuff here. But let, let me just say this real quickly, just because I'm watching 
I'm watching uh, a lot of the comments in the in the chat room on Facebook at the same time we're, we're doing this. Uh, I, I'll just say this. When you talk about the uh, the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies, to the Jews, the, the Hebrews, that was a metaphor or a typology of the, uh, the sea realm, uh, the, the earth realm, and the heavenly realm. And, and what so many people don't understand is that we started out. I mean, from from day one and eternity past in the holy place, we are in the most holy place, but we have oftentimes have had an outer court mentality. We've lived in the sea realm, which is really a place where we really have no uh, to little to no uh, knowledge of who God is, the truth about our father. We come to the earth realm. Religious taught us religion taught us that. And we think we know God and we're trying to learn who God is. But, you know, the real thing to do is to get past that and just operate like you are exactly who God said you are and function in the holy place. Now, uh, I also want to say that that when I teach the book of Revelation, there is nothing there that I teach that is future tense. Uh, first of all, Revelation 1 verse 1 defines the whole book which sure is does. a symbolic book, and it's yep, the yep. revelation of Jesus Christ. And let me explain the revelation of Jesus Christ being spoken to the soul of mankind so that the soul of mankind awakens. You talk about going on a soul-winning journey. We're saving souls. We're saving mindsets. Yes. That is the reality here. But, huh. but when I say this and I talk about Christ and I talk about the eternal Christ a whole lot in my teachings, but what I'm doing is I'm saying when you look at Genesis chapter 1 and now I'm in Revelation, 21 and 22 uh, i'm seeing the end from the beginning but when you look at genesis 2 to the end of, of revelation chapter 20 you see a whole lot of stuff that mankind thought was true that was veiled uh perceptions of who god was and perce veiled perceptions of who he was and so we keep thinking that one of these days it's going to all be done one of these days. And, you know, it's like you were talking about, uh, Dr. Michael, that, you know, uh, w w uh, about uh, the, the, the crown and, and being kings and about the throne. Uh, you are the throne of God, but also he is the throne. And you, you cohabit. Uh, let me just say it this way. You cohabit with the fullness of God in the same space. And this here's the space. You ready for this? The space is everything that, uh, that, that the universe affords okay there is no limit to the space okay whatever space god created that's the space that you're a part of you're integrated in it you're a part of this this massive creation and so if i could just say this stop can and i i really don't mean this to be harsh but everybody watching stop confining yourself to that's your it. human experience Amen. Stop limiting yourself to your human experience because you as spirit are much bigger than that even though you have an earthly realm perception okay you know apostle brian i don't know if apostle brian porter uh, uh, Port, brian porter i didn't know he was your son uh apostle uh, uh brian christian uh, stole that name Christian. Um, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't know if he's got it right or not, but he just asked me the question one day. He says, what if as spirit beings, we were dreaming and a part of that dream is our earthly perception. It's not real. It's just a vapor. It's just a temporary thing because we treat it like it is the sum total That's of it. our whole experience. That's, That's good. And, and so therefore, we embrace sickness, we embrace discouragement, we embrace COVID-19, we embrace uh, uh, the divisions in churches and in communities. We embrace all of this stuff because we have this earthly realm perception that's based on if I can see it, if I can touch it, if I can hear it, and, and that must be the truth, but it's not because the scripture says, Paul said, it's only temporary. It's just subject to change. But the things that I can't see that I can't actually put my uh, <laughs> on that's eternal. Uh, the Bible says, uh, the, the Passion Translation says it's of the eternal realm. Uh, so I just want to say to everybody that, you know what, we're living in a the, the greatest time ever, which this is the time of great revelation unfolding of who you are. And, you know, if, if you was to say, and I'm not, again, I don't want to start a debate tonight or an argument or nothing or uh, get out there on a limb. But if you was to say you are God, I'm not going to fall out with you. Okay, because uh, God's not envious of that. 
My father is not jealous and he's not envious of that. But I will say that my best discovery still in the Hebrew to this day is that who I am in comparison to my father as creator is the smallest measurement of distance. And what that means to me is God sees me as his equal, even though I see just that little bit of saying, I honor you, father, because you are the creator. It's like Dr. Roy Richmond said, I'm not the source, but man, I'm of the source. I'm so of the source that I ought to project be projecting everything that the source is so i don't know if this helps or hurts if this just opens a whole bunch of <laughs> watching tonight but uh i'm just telling you that it's not about the future it's about right now live right. in the moment and embrace when you look at the scriptures from genesis to genesis 2 to revelation the end of chapter 20 everything in between and you see jesus in scripture you're seeing yourself Okay, he is the exact representation of the father. And let me just say this, how can you throw away as he is, so are we in this world and say that I'm not just like Jesus. I'm not of him. We're not of that many membered body of the one. You can't go picking and see, we did that in our Pentecostal days, Dr. Dr. Uh, Cindy. We, we would tear out scriptures in our minds, throw this away, throw that away because it didn't fit the whole thing and just kind of pick and choose with our little collection of scriptures to try to prove our point. This isn't about my point. This is about my father's view, and my father is the creator of all things, and guess what? I am so proud to be a part of this. this and, and Apostle Jermaine, you said something tonight that's really uh, uh, a revelation, that we are as of the Godhead. We're all of the Godhead. We're all of that one, and uh, it's time that we stop preaching dualism and preaching separation and start preaching yeah. that we're exactly who God says we are, right? Amen. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Cindy, can you run with that? I can. I'll can take you preach that on that? and I'll run with it right down the beach. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. So let me go around. Uh, I got to go around in order so I don't get messed <laughs> up here. I've got to go sequentially. I just got a little <laughs> preach on, that's all. <laughs> oh, yes. That's what I, we have enough some summer revival up in here. Um, <laughs> Late summer, late summer camp meeting. You guys are thought leaders. You know that? You're thought leaders. Um, somebody's got to push this thing out where it needs to go. So just, um, I want you guys to get bolder, okay? <laughs> I, don't hold back. Y'all are holding back. No, no, seriously. I really think that's there's something to that. Don't ever back down on what you're saying because Dr. Michael Porter, what you just described was the white throne judgment. Did you know that? You just described what the white throne judgment. Yep. Uh, Y'all got to go back and rewind the tape. If you don't know what, rewind whatever this is. What is this? A, not a tape. I'm old. Can you tell? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be 60 in October. So I'm saying old terms. But go back and rewind this to what Dr. Michael Porter said just a few minutes ago. He actually described to you the white throne judgment. It's already happened. It's already occurred. God judged us righteous, okay? He judged us in right standing with him and the son. That's one thing. Some people might get upset at what I'm about to say, but that's okay. It won't be the first time. You know, we have to love each other where we are. But we do not teach the Trinity because we believe God is one and we believe that he's far more than three. He's you and me. So we are not limiting God to three personalities and three beings and whatnot. He's in you. So that makes him even bigger than the Trinity, right? He's Elohim. He's He's, am he's amazing, okay? And even the dogs get the crumbs off the table, Apostle Jermaine. Even the dogs get the crumbs off. This is, you know, I thought that was funny when you picked up your dog because I was going, you know, there's something prophetic about that. I believe it has to do with everybody needs a righteousness consciousness, even though that woman told Jesus, you know, uh, asked Jesus for a blessing. Jesus said, you're not part of us. You're not part of the in crowd, your inner circle. And she said, uh-uh now, even the dogs get the crumbs off the table. She spoke up just like your dog That's speaking good. up right now, That's tonight. <laughs> you know, we got to get bold and know yeah. that we're all worth it. Not Nobody's inferior. 
in the kingdom of God. Nobody's inferior. There's no inferiority, period. And so, and they're, you know, and, and we're all, uh, you, Ephesians 1 and 2, come on. We've been seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Been seated is past tense. Therefore, we are seated now, not gonna get seated later on. We've already, that's where our position is. We are far above all principalities and powers. We're way above all that. So anytime somebody starts to want to go into some kind of demonic uh, convo conversation or some kind of um, look, you know, we don't give this stuff an audience. People say, do you think you're above that? Absolutely. <laughs> We've been seated <laughs> together in Christ far above, above it. We are above it. I am above it. Aren't you above it? And I yeah. like teaching people they are above it also. So that's what's important. And um, yeah, I wanted to say that in that prologue in the book of Revelation, which isn't a book, it's a letter, dadgummit. But I made it into a book. <laughs> But it's a letter. It's not even a book. But it's a prologue. That's the um, that's the disclaimer that these things are soon and near, and and it's you know the revelation of Jesus Christ is written to the seven churches that were in Asia Minor. I don't know about y'all, but I ha I don't hear very much about Asia Minor anymore. Do you? <laughs> I mean, when y'all hear world news, y'all say today in Asia Minor. I mean, come on. That's gone. That's all in the first century. So, um, yeah, we are in such a powerful place. And part of what we're doing tonight in this panel is we are stretching people to think way beyond, way, way, way beyond just one little realm, you know, one little place, one little mindset. And uh, it's exciting to me. It, it's very and it's exciting to y'all too. I know you. <laughs> it's kind of hard to wind down after this. Yeah. I mean, when we say good night, y'all, have a nice week. See you next Tuesday night. I'm jacked up for two or three hours. I mean, I have to. My husband's going. Are you going to calm down? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's called Kingdom Crack. You know what that is? Kingdom <laughs> Crack. Because I, I call it Kingdom Crack. Because it's like a breaker anointing. It cracks stuff open. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just breaks stuff open and it makes you think. It's like, wow. So, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to come down off that. I'm not even drinking coffee. So, this yeah. is all God. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we have been taught a lot of things, but we've also, we've all, as they say in, in today's generation, that we, we've also talked a lot of smack. I'll give you one area that Dr. K and I are going to be talking about this Thursday. We ha we have misunderstood the concept of death to the point that all we've talked about is is that we're we're aging, we're dying, we're you know uh, yeah you hear it every day you know my I heard my dad talk death until he died um, um, and I and I I don't I don't mean any disrespect toward him but you know death was a part of uh, uh, the Adam concept the Adam lie uh, death was not a part of the creation concept. And so the, so here again, from Genesis 2 to Revelation 20, uh, the end of chapter 20, you know, we see the death concept, but, but it was not the God concept. You know, uh, when you look at Genesis, and I'll be talking about Revelation um, uh, 21, verse 3 tomorrow on the show. And when you look at it, he said, I've, I've made my I tabernacle with men. Yeah. Uh, that's where I chose. Do you know if you look at the implications of that scripture, you're looking back to Genesis chapter 1 in eternity past, seeing that was God's original design, that his tabernacle was with mankind. He tabernacled. And I'll be explaining yep. what that phrase means tomorrow. But the, th the thing is, is that we, we've really gotten uh, so much junk <laughs> <laughs> that we sometimes it's all and here's a bad one they say it's well, it's just human nature to talk that way uh well it's it's been a took a lot of years of conditioning yep. our thinking to talk that way That's and right. so we need to get death and destruction war um uh sickness uh, you know everybody gets it i mean look what's going around now everybody gets it and uh, you know i remember when they told me that i had a great uncle that died of huntington's disease and i was told blatantly by family, I was going to get die of the same thing. Well, you know, and I, and I said, no, not me. That's that's not for me. 
well, we can make choices. That's right. But that, like Dr. Michael says, we, we also have to begin to speak like a king. We have to speak from our kingship, our kingness. Right. Uh, we are priests and kings, not of him, maybe of the father, but we're kings and priests with the eternal Christ. And do you know that we reign now with the eternal Yes. Christ? There's not going to be an 8,000th year. We're in the 7,000th year. And you know, according to the best Jewish calendars, we're already in the 7,000th year. And the south seventh, you, that's why this revelation is bursting forth, because the 7,000th year is the reign of the many-membered body of the eternal Christ. And we reign now, not tomorrow, not in the past. Uh, it's right now we reign, and we reign in him, with him, of him, as him, I mean, whatever phrase you want to put on it. Apostle Jermaine, uh, give us a closing word, brother. <laughs> so then that means that, you know, Jubilee is every day. Um, you get to live in the reality of Jubilee uh, because, again, this is about nature. You know, what is norma normative? I'm going to use this word, normative. This is normal Christianity. <laughs> um, I you know that's you know, that's what that's what we have and that's what we're sharing. I mean, it, it it doesn't sound normative or this is normal Christianity because we've we've had these or delusions of seeing ourselves as mere human. Uh, but the re, but we're awakening, uh, and it's a global awakening, and it's not just something associated with Christian faith you know, the Christian community, you know, humanity is waking up. Um, and that's exciting. And so this, it, these are exciting times um, to share, uh, uh, to one, to, to pioneer uh, into uh, what others may view the, the fringes of Christianity. Yeah. But again, this is what's normative, okay? It's, it's not normative because we, we've been conditioned to perceive and see you know, um, the gospel or good news in light of behavior, behavior modification, rather than in reference to nature, you know, uh, what is uh, a, a unveiling or a restorative viewpoint or perspective of our true nature, you know, what is the true essence of our nature. Um, and so, as Dr. Cindy was saying about being bold, you know, in, in being audacious. I think I shared this, that God, the invitation is, you know, to be audacious, to be bold. That's also a part of, you know, the kingdom culture. You know, there's a sense of boldness, you know, that comes with that. Like you were saying, people were saying that, you know, you can't say that, like you're being proudful and agreeing with God. No, you're actually being humble. <laughs> you know, it may come off to others as a sense of pride. No, you're just stating the reality of what is. You know, we'll say it is what it is in reference to uh, a situation or a circumstance based on a human perception of things. It is what it is, as if it can't change. No, this is what it is. You are who God says that you are. So it is what it is. So see yourself in the light of who Father says you are. See yourself in the light of his goodness. See yourself in the light of his righteousness. See yourself in the light of his love, not yours. Uh, uh, it, it is the essence of all that he is. And so it, it is, as you were saying, the equity that's there. So it's all his, you know, and it's shared within us. So it's not something separate like his righteousness and then my righteousness you know, is as filthy rags. That was his perception. That was uh, the psalmist's perception, <laughs> not God's perception of him. You had uh, uh, Gideon. Gideon who was already a mighty man of valor. You know, it just took some inner dialogue. It took some inner agreement, like uh, Dr. Porter was saying, you know, you are the king of your kingdom and you have a choice to act in, in, in light of your authority and your kingship, you have every right to exercise your kingship, uh, uh, graceness, authority, perception, live in that reality, ponder that reality, uh, meditate on that, meditate on these things that are good, lovely, good reports. So I know I'm then, <laughs> then ranted on there, no problem. but I just, this is, this is just passionate to me too, because, uh, I know what it is to be in a place other than an opinion uh, or holding to an opinion shaped by religious conditioning, shaped by my own negative views and perceptions of myself, low self-esteem, rejection against 
It gives life to these right. things. And, and we label these things, you know, as demonic spirits and, you know, uh, uh, no, these are manifestations of religious trauma. <laughs> That's what it is. You know, so we're going to call this is so it's imperative. Um, yeah, challenge. What we may be saying is challenging. You know, people want to write it off as, you know, something as new age or things like that. No, this is resonating eternal truths, you know, <laughs> that we are sharing. And, 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 and the fruit, to judge a thing, judge it by its fruit and seeing the fruit of people's lives being radically changed and the testimonies of people, you know, uh, no, the fear or, you know, looking for a demon around every corner. No, because I'm, I'm, in, I'm living it out of, uh, in the reality that his goodness is always everywhere, every day. <laughs> That's my expectation. I live with an air of excitement. Not just saying I don't have moments. Listen, a buddy of mine has just passed away. You know, but the goodness of God, you know, is is evident to me. It's a reality to me. It's my nature. And so you you go through uh, uh, these moments and things in life, and you look at, like you said, death. You look at it in an eternal perspective. So I didn't lose nobody. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so the reality. Of, of this sense of loss or death, you know, is no longer from a human experience. So humanity or the human experience is just as, defi as, as div divine as what we would perceive an angel's life or, or anything like that. So humanity is divinity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, did you hear that? Uh, uh, Apostle Germain, what like what kind of practices? Would say. Uh, Brett asked, "What like what kind of practices?" Uh, you know what? I was on the tangent. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let him rephrase the question if he wants to, and and because uh, I, yeah, I, I, I missed that too. <laughs> Uh, Apostle Michael, um, this is so good, uh, even though we're closing. Uh, you know, we were just raised in some stuff that wasn't the truth. You and I were both raised denominationally. So we were, you might say, educated denominationally in spite of college. Set that aside. We were educated denominationally. Uh, but we are waking up to the truth that we're discovering. And you know what? It not only feels right, it, you, can, you can actually uh, bear it out in, in uh, theological studies to be right. Yeah. And that's what people uh, sometimes refuse to embrace. But that's okay. They're coming along. Uh, come, give us a closing word. Okay. Um, well, you know, I don't know. I just keep thinking for some reason I won't plan on saying this, but in quantum theory, uh, it's the observer that makes the difference. Whatever, whatever the observer observes, that's what becomes reality. And so whatever we are conscious of, we manifest. Whatever we are conscious of, we manifest. And we release the reality that whatever's in our awareness, that's the reality we release. And so let me throw this out. This has nothing to do with scripture, but I was a big Game of Thrones fanatic when that series was on HBO for eight years. And I remember this just coming to my memory. There was a time in the story when a 13, 14 year old boy became king of this kingdom called Westeros. And he fell in love with a girl and was going to marry her. And she got involved in this religious sect. And because he loved the girl, he made a decree declaring this, declaring this religious sect, the religion of the kingdom. And they began to really persecute people and they were just dogmatic and they all kind of stuff. But there was a scene in the movie that just come into my memory a minute ago where this war is about to be fought over this religion. And um, the king's uh, uncle rides up on a horse. He's standing on this great stairway to this temple, to these gods that they worship. And all these people are fussing and fighting. It's about ready to go down. And he rides up. He's a knight in the kingdom. He rides up and he looks at this 14-year-old kid and he goes... You know you are the king. All you have to do is stand here on this step and change the decree. Mm -hmm. And there won't be no war. And All you got to do is say, I've changed my mind. This is now the law of the kingdom. Amen. He didn't do it. The young boy was so in love with the girl, he wouldn't go against the girl. And he, he led it. And this big thing goes on. You know, I won't talk to the whole series. 
but that just came into my mind. So, you know, I'm the king of the kingdom. And then the other thing that popped in my mind that might take just a couple of minutes here, my grandkids love to, when we go to the mountains, they love to do something called tubing. It's where you drop them off on a river and they're in these round tubes and they float down the river. You don't do anything, but just float and you can stop and get on the rocks and wherever. And it's like a four hour trip and then somebody picks them up at the other end, you know, where they stop. And so they, they, just, they just go with the flow of the river. There's no, it's not like white water rapids. We've done that too. But this is just like easy going, just floating along, having a good time. Some people take coolers that float and stuff like that. All right, so for me, this is true of me. Most of my life, if not all of my life, I have tried to go upstream. I, I did it in religion. I did it when I was a preacher. I never really was myself. I never really was my true self. Yeah. I always acted like I thought I should act. And based on my belief system, I swam upstream and I got burnout. And a friend of mine recently uh, recommended somebody who was talking about swimming upstream and I watched their video. So thank you to my friend if you're watching. But all my, all, most of my life, if not all of my life, I have swam upstream, gone against the current. And so I'm going to say in life, the spirit is like a flow. And you can go upstream if you want to. There's no condemnation here. God still loves you the same. Yeah. Yeah. But I found myself yeah. beat up, tired, wore out, disgusted, angry, and keep on putting the adjectives on there because I was going upstream. And the thing about beginning to go with the flow of the spirit is you don't have to do anything but stop going upstream. And the yeah. moment you stop, the natural flow of the river just starts taking you in that direction. And that's what my grandkids do. They just get on the tube. They don't paddle. They don't do anything. They just lay there and have fun and throw water on each other and whatever they do. And they just float along for four hours. The, the stream <laughs> takes them along at a nice, easy, leisurely pace. And we pick them up on the other end. So I'm thinking that there's nothing in my life that I want that's upstream. Everything yeah. in my life that I want is downstream. Good teaching. But I keep trying to go upstream to get what I want. Mm. I, did, I mean, I did that ministry for so many years, fighting, struggling, working. How are we going to save this city? I would even pray, pray prophetically, for, you know, just go through all of that. It's all upstream work. It really is. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to say this for my closing remark. I believe part of what, is happening here is that when we came here as humans, if you want to say that, I'm not going to call us humans, but that's what most people would say. When we came into this physical experience, let me say this, mm -hmm. we quantumly focused on just the natural experience. And so all we have experienced or most all we have experienced is things in the natural realm, Dr. Bill. Yeah, but yeah. now we are learning to be seers in the spirit and see into the invisible realm. And we're not focused on the natural so much. Somebody mentioned this before. Once we were totally focused on the natural and how that felt. But now we're beginning to focus on the spirit. Like the scripture says, you know, concentrate on these things. Concentrate on the unseen things. So as we begin to see ourselves as the king sitting on the throne with the scepter in our hand, we look out with the third eye or the spiritual eye and we see into the unseen realm and we stop swimming upstream and we start going downstream and things become easy and things become natural. And once again, I have not mastered this, but at least I know about it now. And so... Yeah. Just saying what is happening here, the teaching that is happening here, or the conversation, let me say, that's happening here, will benefit us in that we will finally start being who we really are or who we always have been before we came here and started having this physical experience. And we learned through our parents, through our church, through our whatever teachings to focus all or mostly on this natural experience. 
And so we see reality as what we see in the natural. And, but now we're beginning to see reality as what we see in the spirit. And we are beginning to concentrate on what is unseen by the natural eye, but seen by the spiritual eye. And it's now beginning to manifest. The mm -hmm. king is starting to talk differently in the kingdom. The king Come just talked about natural things and natural things and fighting against the flow. Now the kings that you are is beginning to speak a different language into the kingdom and release a different vibration and release a different uh, experience into the kingdom and things are beginning to turn and change. And so that's the benefit I believe of conversations like this. Yes. Yes. And, and uh, Dr. K uh, posted a scripture earlier and I'd, I'd like to find it real quick before we give Dr. Cindy her closing word. Yes. Uh, First Thessalonians 5, 23 in the Amplified states that we are sanctified spirit uh, uh, filled uh, through and through spirit, soul, and body. And you had said that earlier, Dr. Michael, about uh, us, uh, everything about us being spirit. And I had a, I had a class recently that I taught on spirit, soul, and body. And I taught that, that God didn't create us to be three separated beings, even though there's been division, you could say duality, but it's bigger than duality. It's that there's been a division within us. We are all three of those beings, just like father, son, Holy spirit are not separated from themselves, vying for power. And I do understand that, uh, you know, there's a lot of teachings about Trinity being, uh, founded from the Catholic church, but let's, let's say it this way that the, the original, Catholicism, those who actually were a part of canonizing scripture, was not the Catholicism we saw that we see today as a religion. So it was very different. But I, I don't really care because I see Trinity in scripture, but but I can't see anything also. I mean, when I look at Trinity, I still see oneness. I still see one in the same. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I love my one of my favorite scriptures. I think it's Ephesians 4 verse 5 in the Passion Translation says that God is one and so are we. And we're all a part of that same oneness. And I love that about the Father. So, so much powerful stuff. Dr. Cindy, give us a closing word, if you would, please. So, um, back to definitions. Um, let us get some new definitions. One is um, that term human. Mm -hmm. I think you'll like this. Hugh, H-U-E, man. A hue is a color, a human, and we all have our own vibration and frequency like color has. All colors have an electromagnetic frequency, okay? And they all, co they all are um, mirrored with a sound, hertz. And you can look this up, you can do the research where you can see where um, the colors, you know, in the spectrum ha all have vibrations and frequencies. So each one of us, just picture this, Jesus is the light of the world and in him is all color and every color in the spectrum. And each one of those colors is a hue. And so that's how come we are human because we all have a vibration and a frequency that emits the vibration and frequency of Christ. And that's why together um, it's important to have, uh, to come together, not just be you alone, but together we all bring a hue. We all bring a vibration. We all bring a frequency. And um, I just wanted to say that. And also uh, this, uh, I wrote these words down right here. While you are living your life, don't forget to live the unlived life within. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. There's so much on the inside that we actually are and, and uh, of the father's mind that was eternally implanted in us that we haven't tapped into yet. And I, I want to just chime in with Dr. Michael and say, you know what, I haven't got it all perfect yet. I haven't figured it all yet, out yet, but uh, man, I'm aware of some stuff and uh, turned on to some stuff. And, uh, you know, I feel like we've come to a place that 
Uh, you know, I remember several years ago, I saw a vision as I was going into the house and I saw the threshold changing colors and it was a one way entrance. I crossed over into something in this, wow. this momentary vision, but I knew that it was one way and I couldn't go back. And I feel like that's what happens when you're awake in the truth. Uh, you literally can't go back. Uh, you don't fight against it or you don't get, I mean, you, you have your moments, but it's like, there ain't no way. I, I can't forget about what I've learned. And, and, I, and I think that this is such an important uh, program, this panel discussion. Uh, I got my start on uh, webinars with a panel discussion and uh, many, of, uh, many years ago, four and a half years ago, I guess. And so this is very important. Uh, I want to just say this too, that we are uh, a human ray, a, 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 a human beings, uh, the, the Hebrew says, a species known as mankind. That's the Hebrew word Adam in, Revel in Genesis chapter one. In Genesis chapter two, it is the Hebrew word Adam, and it is Adam, the man. And I am not of that religion. That is not my king, and that religion doesn't speak for me. I speak out of the eternal truth of the eternal mind of my father. Uh, gang, such a great discussion tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have to come back to, we're going to be on a, something different next week. We'll see where this goes, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great to have this panel back in full bloom and um, great job, gang. Hey, everybody watching. Um, if you had uh, John Sanders, awesome love. It is, it, uh, it, I'm vibrating now in oneness with y'all. <laughs> uh, I love y'all because the Apostle Paul said that in the King James Version. Yeah, so, yeah, anyway. All right, everybody. Hey, click like and share if you would. Um, we will be back. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Brett's asking, you know, sometimes that we'd have a Q&A, and I think it would be good if people are, um, you know, writing in and stuff. We, we might could do that. Um, uh, but anyway, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you uh, in the morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, Revelation 21, verse 3. I'll take another look. Thursday night, Dr. K. Fairchild will be with me. Friday morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Toon will be with me for part three. So we'll see everybody then. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>